to you a generalizable modeling framework that uses telemetry derived artificial intelligence algorithms um, and distribution models to inform species interactions with offshore wind energy. Um, sorry about that. Also, thank you for all sticking through that title and not running for the door. Um, to give a big thanks right off the bat to all the people and groups who really put in a lot of effort to make this work that I do possible. So, looking at offshore wind energy, the Atlantic Outer Continental Shelf of the U.S. is current focal point for offshore wind installations. Um, there's a number of near-term projects in various stages of development. Many of them are located in northeast and mid-Atlantic regions, and these are all planned in order to meet ongoing accelerating and moving goals for both state and federal clean energy. Um, renewable energy products and installations, these are good. I'm not going to be the scientist who argues against this, but they are not without concerns. It's a very novel technology, particularly in the U.S. Um, this can lead to novel problems. These are going in at a large commercial scale in order to meet those clean energy goals. And that can lead to very widespread or even site-specific um, environmental ecological effects. And for species that utilize these areas, that can lead to stressors in all phases of operation. So, big question is, how do we minimize potential effects to marine wildlife? There's a huge potential to do this, um, but it's going to require a lot of informed and considered development, informed and considered site selection, um, a lot of the permitting processes that include environmental assessments and impact statements are based on current best available data. As we know with a lot of marine um, habitats, we don't have a lot of this data, especially at scales that are appropriate to our potential management and monitoring. So we need to collect this data, but again, offshore monitoring is expensive and it is very difficult to get the data we need, especially at scales that we need to use it for management. So, Big problem statement here is that without this information, this can really prevent identification or assessment of potential threats that may need additional management intervention at these sites. So what's the solution? Um, like most things with conservation, it's time and money. And most things with conservation, we don't have that. So in lieu of that, we have quantitative modeling methods. Um, framework I'm going to show you uses species distribution models. These are correlative predictive models that quantify species biogeographic relationships. Importantly, they're very good at predicting occurrence of a species outside of areas that you're sampling. They also are very good at giving you scale appropriate data that is very useful for management needs in these areas. A important aspect of the framework I'm going to show you that makes it very useful, very novel, is that we're entirely relying on AI, artificial intelligence algorithms for this work. So these are data-driven, provide a lot of flexibility compared to traditional statistical modeling. Um, particularly, it helps you overcome a lot of those limitations with sampling size and also with expectations of linearity. And while these are used in a lot of other fields, they're very underutilized in ecological fields. Um, and another aspect that we have with this framework is ensemble modeling. So with those AI algorithms that we're going to create, we are going to take a weighted consensus prediction based on some accuracy metric from these models enabled in order to actually create a consensus prediction. So this is what you see with um, forecasting for weather. You see hurricane track predictions where you see multiple models from multiple sources. And you bring the best parts of those models together to get a final, very accurate, very reduced bias prediction. And the best part of the part I want to really focus on for management with this framework is that you get these beautiful map products as output that you can use as decision-making tools to directly use to inform management. So, perfect species for a case study and also for this session right now is the Atlantic sturgeon. Um, we do a lot of work in our lab with Atlantic sturgeon. This is a species that's very long-lived very highly migratory. Um, they spend a lot of their adult lives in near coastal or offshore marine waters that really could interact with these wind sites. So great species to look at for this study. Um, 
like most species that are rare or endangered, like the Atlantic sturgeon, we really are missing a lot of understanding of what's going on with their marine distribution, and this is really necessary to plan management. Um, for a lot of current modeling that we do, and current work and monitoring that we do with these fish, um, especially in offshore wind, we have a lot of projects that are going on, but a lot of them are very site-specific. Um, so there's a lot of trade-offs to kind of looking at those widespread um, just potential implications of wind farms. And one of the most is that it really makes it difficult to underestimate, or excuse me, it makes it very easy to underestimate habitat use for this fish because it's very difficult to implement monitoring over the time frame that they're in marine waters and across their entire life history. So with all that in mind, um, overall research goal for this is just to show you that generalized framework using AI-based ensemble models that are derived from telemetry detections, and we're using these to predict extent of species habitat. And here I'm going to show you how we do that using the Atlantic sturgeon as a case study. Very um, broad, specific, however you want to describe these objectives, and that's, again, one of the points of this talk that I'll get through is that everything we're getting out of this is very generalizable to be either broad or very specific. Um, but we're going to quantify distribution of these fish throughout marine waters, identify spatiotemporal trends, and try to develop detailed map products, which is going to be very important for management. And our lab does a lot of field sampling with Atlantic sturgeon. It's all telemetry acoustic work. We've been tagging these fish for years. Um, we monitor them, especially in marine waters, using submerged receiver arrays through multiple Stony Brook University products. Um, we also are able to get additional detections of these fish as they move throughout research, other research groups' arrays. Um, first step for creating these models, and probably the least fun step, is compiling the data. The extent that I'm looking at here is, again, that entire U.S outer continental shelf of the Atlantic from the coast all the way to the shelf slope. It's a very large area, almost 630,000 square kilometers. And the resolution I want to look at that's going to be important to management is going to be looking at a single kilometer raster resolution. We have our spatially referenced observations of Atlantic sturgeon over two, um, 10 years, almost a decade, so 2011 through 2021. Uh, you can see on this picture that's all the unique locations of fish that we've had show up on our arrays and other arrays. I have these all pulled by month so that we can look at differences between monthly occurrence, differences between monthly distribution. Um, second part of this data compilation is pulling together those environmental gradients that are going to be used to correlate these models. To make these generalizable, I only looked at publicly available data sets. Um, Again, just a lot of small things with modeling. I'm not going to go into the weeds too, but we ended up with a final set of predictors for this of six. So a very small number of predictors we're using to predict these models. Quickly, again, staying out of the weeds, uh, this is the workflow for looking at a monthly ensemble map of occurrence for these fish. We have our presence points. We have our spatial predictors. We have the AI algorithms we're using. These are a mixture of machine learning and artificial neural networks, seven in total that we're using. For each one of those AI algorithms for each month, we are bootstrapping them 100 times. So for every single monthly ensemble, that's going to be based off of 700 total models. And we do a little bit of quality, uh, model quality assessment. Basically, we're trying to see how accurate our predictions are. And we're using specifically area under the curve to weight our final ensemble models. Now, into the results. Um, this shows really that quality of these models, so that assessment. So it's showing that there's very similar trends among those seven artificial intelligence algorithms in terms of accuracy, and accuracy is our ability to correctly predict presences or absences. Importantly for this, random forests, like in most ecological applications, shows up as consistently the better performer. But despite that, all of these algorithms do extremely well, and this is especially compared to traditional statistical, so linear methods that are going to usually, when we do any modeling work like this, we see AUCs of 7 or 0.7 maximum. So this is great. Spatial predictor importance for these models. You can see that this makes biological sense. 
if you're looking at Atlantic surgeon, this is a near coastal species, so depth is showing up as the most important predictor. But you also see other predictors, such as photo period and sea surface temperature, are showing up as important. Those ones we know are really important for how they're making spawning migrations and transitions. So finally, through all the modeling boring stuff to get to the part that is going to be most important to management here. And this is those monthly ensemble distribution maps. So we're seeing predicted occurrence probabilities of Atlantic sturgeon throughout the entire outer continental shelf um, at a raster resolution of one kilometer. I'm going to show you a couple maps that look like these that are showing up here. Um, you're going to see that predicted occurrence, red means higher predicted occurrence, blue means lower predicted occurrence. And the number that's scrolling by underneath the month tells you just really the small sample sizes that we're relying on to make these really broad predictions. Same monthly distribution maps, just shown side by side, so you can look at changes in distribution. So those very simple trends that you can look at to see what these fish are doing throughout this extent. Um, winter months, you see these fish expand in more southerly habitats also increased probability of incurring in offshore waters. During the summer months, it's the opposite. They contract more up towards those potential spawning habitats around the New York Bights, that'd be the Hudson and Delaware River. And then you have transition months, so those occur in the spring and the fall. You zoom in on two of those months, June, which would be a summer month, December, which would be a winter month, and you can look at predicted occurrence of ATS, so Atlantic Surgeon, in those wind energy lease sites. This shows you really just how great, how scalable these models are. Um, this is looking at the overall New York Bight area. So this is all wind energy lease sites in the New York Bight. There's a nice regional scale map that you can use for management and for actually making decisions. You can also zoom in even further because of the resolution of these maps and look at these management decisions on a local scale. And the local scale I am going to show you is the South Fork Wind Farm, just because that's a fun one to look at. We've had a couple of presentations on it. This is a map that was digitized from um, the BOEM approved construction operations plan for this wind farm. It's located off of Montauk. See detail A shows the actual um, planned landing sites for the export cable. Detail B on the right shows the actual wind farm itself and the plant sites for the turbines. And if you look at those very detailed maps, again, you can see just how useful this is for potential siting, for potentially deciding how you want to manage species in this area, or even what species may need it to be managed in this area. So, take home message um, for this is really that this framework provides a very reliable assessment for ecological range impacts. Solid has very excellent accuracy. You can look at these occurrences at fine scale resolution, but over a very broad extent. And it also only takes a small number of predictors to fit these models with very high accuracy. I showed you Atlantic sturgeon because that's the species I have a little bit biased to. It's the species I get to play with. Um, however, these models are very generalizable and they can be readily applied. It's not only to telemetry detections, but any spatially referenced observations. High resolution environmental data sets are easily available, so you can look at parameters that are important to your species. Using those AI algorithms, um, there's a lot of issues with them in the past, with them being very computationally expensive. Uh, that's no longer really the case anymore. But these original models we ran them on a um, gaming PC, basically, that was three years old. Um, and importantly, those algorithms are not going to be as limited by sample size or linearity as the other traditional stats that you're looking at. And finally, the most important part, again, is those map products. Those are going to be very important to managing in these offshore areas, and they are scalable to your management needs. So, again, I'm showing you offshore wind. If you want to look at fisheries interactions, things like that, it's all very easily done within this framework. So future directions with this work is really to get it out. Um, I think it, it needs implemented, if that is where people want to go with this, very immediately. We've got a lot of offshore wind projects that are really blowing up right now. Um, you see 
almost every single state along the coast has offshore wind plans. You can look at a number of different regions with this. You can also look at a number of different species. And really, this framework doesn't just apply to researchers. Um, but it's also very beneficial and can be very important to both industry and regulators in the future. So thank you all very much. I hope I have time for questions.